One of our background themes over the last eight years of Vulko has been identity. Identity, the identity of language teaching in higher education, the identity of language centers within the academic community. At my presentation, I would like to add another, maybe interesting facet to the picture we've been painting over the last eight years. I would like to, and I would dare to attempt a definition of language centers on the basis of a theory called complex adaptive systems, so system theory, complex system theory. A theory which was developed um, in the 80s by J.R. Holland in the Santa Fe Research Institution in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The theory, which actually won um, J.R. Holland a Nobel Prize, by the way, tries to explain the interaction and the emergence, the, the, the product of biological, economic, social, and cultural systems. And it's different from other system theory because it doesn't take things apart. It, does, it assumes that if you wanted to study a system, then it's not enough to take it apart, to study the individual components, and then explain or predict the outcome or the product, the emergence of a particular system. For me, language centers are complex adaptive systems. They interact with their environment, the university at large, and they adapt continuously to their environment. And if they are lucky, they can change the environment. So all in all, what I'll be talking about is the ecology of language centers. Now you may ask, what does this have to do with beavers and wolves? Where do they come in, apart from the fact that it's always nice to put animals in, into a talk? But over the last years, decades, if you like, beavers and wolves have come back to Europe. They were formerly extinct, and now they come back to their old environments, and they found, find it actually changed. The change, human-made changes, are such that they have problems finding their niche again, and they have to rearrange their environment. And at the same time, the environment has to adapt and has to start living and finding ways of living with the creatures. And this, if you believe me or not, is not very much unlike what we do in language centers and, and the context in which we actually live and interact. Now, what is a language center and how does a language center interact with or adapt to its environment? The university. Now, it's part of the university. At the same time, the university in large provides one of the environments. There are other environments in which the language centers interact, the outside world, the business world, the culture of particular um, countries and uh, societies, whatever you like. And in order to understand the environment, we have to ask a question and try to find a solution to the question, how does a university function? And I think this is not only important for our own work. I think more or less it's important for other situations, other contexts in which language, language teaching, language learning, communication is becoming more and more important if you consider that, that the university, not only the universities, but societies at large in Europe become more and more multilingual, multicultural. And I see language centers more or less as, as laboratories of, of this kind of multilingualism and multiculturalism. And maybe if we use those questions I've just asked as research questions, maybe we could, should also find answers to problems that this societies, our societies are facing. Now, let's start with what the, the, the essential question, what is a language center in higher education? And I'm sure that most of you have an answer to that. And I'm sure within our language center communities, it would take us no time actually to find lots of different answers. 
those answers may not, however, be the same that our environment actually has. So they would probably define language centers in a completely different way. Now, the, quest, the answer to the question, what is a language center in this talk is language centers are complex adaptive systems. Actually, this idea came about, if you like, in one of my language classes, believe it or not, which I teach with a Polish philosopher friend, Darius Aleksandrowicz, and I came across, in this particular class, I came across the concept of complex adaptive systems and the characteristics of such systems immediately rang a bell. As I said before, I'm using the, the paradigm, this particular paradigm, which is not a linguistic paradigm as such, though it can be applied to linguistic questions, and I'm using the paradigm uh, from complexity studies. And as I said before, and I repeat, it is a solution to the question, how can we study the outcome of a system, the emergence of a system, when studying the individual components of a system do not provide the answers we were looking for? Now, many biological, cultural, economic, and social systems do not function as linear systems. And I'll come to the question of linear system um, soon. Um, what is the difference between a linear system on the one hand and a complex adaptive system? On my slide, you find the two extremes of both types of systems. A linear system, and presented on my slide, or represented on my slide as, um, in, 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 as a computer, if you like, is, acts as a linear fashion. It, is, it acts one step after the other. You get what you put in the outcome and the emergence is predictable, right? So, and you can study the individual components, and if something goes wrong, you can try to find the individual components which did wrong things, and then you can change it, and then the, the process can start anew and, and lead to the same result. Now, the brain is very different. The brain uh, is a system which interacts, or the components which in, has components which interact simultaneously. The outcome, our thoughts, our mind, which is the emergence of our brain, is highly unpredictable. We can take the computer apart to understand how it functions. If we take the brain apart, I mean, apart from the fact that nobody will survive that, it does not help us to understand our thoughts. What are the characteristics of a complex adaptive system? Well, first of all, there are things called agents. The agents that interact, the components of a system, interacting with each other and with their environment. Their main aim is to survive. And in order to survive, they have, have to adapt to their environment. We cannot understand, however, the functioning of the system, and the, the, the different agents actually have different functions. They're very diverse, and they have different functions within the, the production of the emergence. And we cannot understand, without, as, as with any uh, system, um, understand the, 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 the function of the system by looking at, at on, and studying individual agents. The system is always in a change mode. There's no point in time when the system is stable. No point in time when the system reaches an ideal state. Well, sounds very much like our situation, doesn't it? Now, beavers, you know, go back to beavers for, for a minute, uh, be produce dams in order to survive. The dam, however, is never complete. Beavers keep building and building. In order to understand how a beaver dam is created, it's not enough to study the individual beavers or we study the individual dams. It's, it, we have to look at the interaction. We have to look at the system of the beavers. And I'm sure you've already made the connection, which you now see on my next slide. Let's take our prototypical language center in higher education. In order to survive in academia, and survival mode is what we know, our different agents, call them agents, call them members of the language center, call them teachers, call them staff of the language centers, have to interact internally 
some externally, and they do it in very different ways. Our emergence, and that is our language program, is constructed as a result of this interaction. Listen to the stakeholders, we listen to our um, clients, if you like, to our students, and then turn what we know, what we found out, into a language program. And for that, in order to come up with a, an effective language program, of course, we have to interact, sometimes across languages, we have to interact internally. And this, this, this process is a continuous process. It never stops. Oh, it should never stop. It's an ideal situation. In the ideal, actually, is the never-ending process and not the stable state. Innovation, and this is the connected with change, is one of the key terms at every conference and workshop on language teaching at university. We love diversity. We really love it. However, as the adaptation process never reaches an ideal state, sometimes we're frustrated. We lose our patience with one another, with ourselves, and we become, we lose motivation. But if we know from the onset that we have to deal with a changing environment, and this changing environment is the ideal state, if you like, of the system, then we're probably less frustrated. Hopefully, we never know. Now, what does our university look like? What does our environment look like? This is the system to which we have to adapt. Is it a linear system or is it complex and adaptive? Now, a lot of our stakeholders think it is linear. It may appear linear. If you look at organigrams, and here you see an organigram of a German university, it appears linear in the sense that it has lines of command, it has um, responsibilities, it has a clear definition, or it supposedly has a clear definition of the different components. It looks a bit like the business model. And it does what businesses do. They develops a plan, it develops strategies and policies. In our interaction, however, we get a different picture. We sometimes do not know even though they are sort of specified as the stakeholders, they are, have a certain task assigned, responsibilities assigned to, we sometimes do not know who the real decision makers are and with whom we should interact in order to survive. So, as a but, a clear but, this is not the university, the linear system is not the university as we know it, it is different. And now here you see the picture, which I think is more, um, that's much closer to the situation we're dealing with. I think the university is not a system. It consists as such. It, it's not an interactive uh, or an interacting system as such with a clear emergence. It consists of several systems. It consists of networks, groups, with individual or group interests, and, and most of the decisions are based on individual or group interests and not on interests of a whole system called university. And in a lot of instances, those decisions in those different interests, groups, or systems, or subsystems can override official strategies and policies. And sometimes on the pretext of financial restrictions. We don't have the money, and therefore we have to change the policy. There are probably self, sort of several, as I said, several systems in that you can see the pictures. And sometimes it's not very clear where the decision makers sit in, in what system they... So we have to interact with a variety of different systems which actually interact in a very different, sometimes in very different ways. Sometimes, and this is very important for academia, um, some agents have their most important um, systems outside the university as such, and the emergence of research actually comes from the uh, cooperation with, with the networks outside the system and not within the system. So I think most of the emergence of the university is actually not based within a particular institution, but 
outside a particular institution, and the institution has to claim the result for, it, for, for, for the institution itself. The language center is different. As you can see on the slide, and my, my very crude picture of, of, of what I think is the system of the language center, it is, or should be, an interactive system with a common goal and diverse actors. The product of language programs are the result of a combination of adaptation of the environment and of external interaction with the language teaching community and internal with language center colleagues. By the way, the red dot in the middle marks the changeable position of the leading person in the system, which has a different function from, from the, the leading persons in, in, let's say, in businesses or in, in, in more um, other networks that are more linear. Um, the, he is in command, or he or she is in command, however, he is not the only source that's not the starting point of the emergence and sometimes not even in control, in full control of the emergence. But that's a typical aspect of, of, a, of a, a nonlinear or complex system. The role of the leading person is to keep the network together and facilitate or initiate interaction. And the leader should also take, and you can see what can happen, which is not an ideal state, uh, on the slide has to take every effort to work against niche creation. And that could result, because niche creation is the most dangerous uh, development, uh, because it could lead into different groups adapting in a very different way to the environment, could lead to the, the, the beginning of a breakup of the system and that, or of conflicting emergence, if you like. You, so you have to work against this. And the, this leads me to my last question in the last slide. Um, what are the consequences for leadership? And I think there are a few. One is we have to ensure diversity by carefully selecting agents, and I think we have to evolve because we are dealing with a system with different interests, but which comes together. Th those interests actually come together in the um, in the emergence. We have to. Um, include um, the and involve all the other agents when you select new people. That, that's very clear. You can't do it simply on your own. And sometimes, and and also, I think it's better to select somebody who's not too close to you, who's not too similar to you, because you have to ensure diversity. You have to support and initiate communication. It, this goes without saying, and and you should not support subgroups by siding with subgroups, because that can lead to niche creation. Trust your gut feelings. And I think, after all, you are in the position where you belong and, and you have experience enough. Assigning tasks, and this is my last point, do not try to transform your center into a linear system. Do not bang it into a linear system. It's important to assign responsibilities, but at the same time, it should also allow for people to have their own, to a certain extent, to have their own uh, agenda, to have their, to let crea creativity actually, uh, or give enough room for creativity, and then of course you get a better emergence and you get better adaptation to the environment. Finally, Vulko. Is Vulko a complex adaptive system? I don't know. I think it can provide the platform. It can provide another environment which can be used as a controlled environment in the sense that we can compare our work, our adaptation to the environment we're adapting to on a daily basis and see how others adapt to their environment. And that this comparison can help us to become more efficient in our own environment. I think that Volker has developed into a another academic complex social system, but that would merit another talk. Thank you very much for watching.